Thank you for listening to The Lawyer's Daughter. This is Jen Carroll, and this podcast does not have any video. I know I'm on YouTube, but that doesn't matter. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast here. Let's go get started. Hello, my friends. It is August 23rd, and it is day 75, and I am... Oh my God, I wanted to start this with like... Dearly beloved, in the spirit of Prince. But then there's been so much music at this convention. I I blasted the music this morning in the house. My poor neighbors, they know I'm in a mood when the music coming out loud through the doors and the windows. Night four was incredible. And here's the thing. Here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to hit it again. The, here's the thing. We're supposed to do something, right? But my commitment is to help you know what to do. Because there's just a lot and... It has to work for you. So we're going to talk about that today. Just how to take, I have four steps for you to do something starting today. Seriously, four steps. Super easy, but, and hopefully helpful. But first let's just dish a little bit, shall we? Because I know I mentioned this yesterday and this is why I had to just pivot on the podcast because I have never identified more with what is happening this week as a woman, as a businesswoman, and as a Gen X human. And this is, I realized last night, I'm just sitting, I was exhausted. I, last night, it, the messaging probably went in me harder because I was just more tired. Tired because I really want to do this podcast and do a good job. And tired because I'm so excited. And let's admit it, we have been through four days of programming that's been amazing. In fact, for oh, so here's, this is a classic Gen X moment. I have to explain this because I think the youngsters, I, I always feel like I'm talking to my daughter on this podcast. In the old days, we used to all come home at night. And if we weren't out partying, and I don't know who those people were, because most of us were tired from going to work. This is like in the old days, let me think if I can give it to you. Probably in the 90s. That's the the late 1900s, as I read on Twitter today, if you'd all like to feel really old. But in the late 1900s, we used to all watch a show. There were different shows we'd all watch, but big masses of people would have shows they watched in common. And it started early. It started like for the 60s kids and the 70s kids. It started with like the Brady Bunch and the Cassidy, uh, with the Partridge family, the Cassidy family. Now you can tell I really am an aging Gen Xer because I actually know their real names, but the Partridges, for God's sakes, they were the Partridge family. And that's how we knew them. Anyway, we'd all watch our shows. And then the next day we'd have something to talk about in common. And it was a real unifier as funky and odd as that sounds. Like Katie tells me today, there's influencers that unify. That's great. But you still drop into that content at when you're ready. And that's probably this digital access versus analog. And you have to think about this for a minute, but our brains in a lot of ways were meant to handle analog. And what I mean by analog is like a watch that has a face on it versus a digital face. When you look at a watch with a a face on it, an analog face, you see the time, but you almost, and you, but you see it in the context of what the time could also be. So, and it always is progressing forward in chronological order. That's the most important part, that there's a chronological order for how something rolls out. For, for Gen Xers, that means a show has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if it, we were really like it had a very good theme song, so we could start off by singing along. So it really did bring us along with it. If we watched the news, there was a mi- beginning, a middle, and at the end, there was usually some lighthearted story or commentary. So you kind of knew how to digest that. Like we had these norms for how to take in information. One of the best things we used to have that was analog was an album. And an album was more than just the hit songs. An album was a story. If it was done really well, and there are some out there that are done remarkably well. There was a whole Twitter thread about this, about albums that really tell a story. Uh, The Pink Floyd, The Wall. I'll throw out the easy one. Uh, The Who by uh, Tommy by The Who. Things like that. But they told the story from the first song to the last song. That's analog. And so what happened this week for a lot of us, not everybody, a lot of the younger people still went digital. They dropped into sound bites and they dropped into things not being connected. But for people who watched the convention, especially in the evening hours, you had an analog consumption of content. And we all were in the same place at the same time, consuming the same content and generally having similar feelings. And that's a Gen X thing. We didn't 
often have our parents around to tell us how to feel about it. We did it with uh, MTV videos, like th things that used to bring us together. They told a story and we shared a common experience. And that's what's happened this week. And I'm a little afraid. I'm going to try to do it with this podcast to keep us connected. But I'm a little afraid we're not going to have those kinds of connections in the next few weeks. It, it, the noise is going to get louder. People are going to get stupider. Not our people. The campaign will get stupider. And they've warned us. They warned us and they warned us and they warned us. So honest to God, that's one reason I have this podcast is to help us stay focused and not get distracted and stay focused on what matters, the messages that matters, the messages that are working, how a campaign works, why it's important to democracy. Every part of this, I intend to hopefully validate as being vital to who we are as a country. In fact, when Kamala and um, her sister... Maya, wow. When they talked about what we mean as a country, and I think Adam Kinzinger hit on this too, this idea of we're here for each other. We're here to work together. We are the electorate. We are America. How we carry ourselves, how we use our words, how we use our behaviors all the time, especially as a preschool teacher, I will tell you all the time, you need to know you're modeling behavior. And it's not just for your kids. You model behavior for people who don't know how to do what you do. You model behavior for people who are afraid to do what you just did, which is, I don't know, I paid for that person's groceries because they were out of money. Or I told the guy who was being racist to stop. Just stop. I didn't fight him. I just said stop. Those things, who we are, is what we're signing up for. And that's, that's why we're here. So, all right, I, I got fired. I, I, as a woman, like there were women everywhere and they're all smart and they came with receipts because that's what we do. We smart women have to come with receipts because nobody believes us. Even when they're in the room, they have to restate our ideas for us. And last night and this week, that didn't happen. There was no mansplaining. There were just guys with really good messages, but they didn't try to explain the women. Wow. And again, if you're a man, I'm so glad you're listening because you're on this team and this matters. This idea of honoring and lifting each other up regardless of any other criteria you want to ascribe to a person, but you see the inner goodness in them and you want to lift them up, you're on board. That's it. You're already part of the team. You're the Americans we want to be with. That's the kind of America I want to live in. Okay, let me get back to this speech. Um, this, when I look at all of her speech, and I'm going to do more on this this weekend, but her delivery, the structure, um, the first part, her acceptance part, if you notice, she did the story, she did her speech in arcs. And when we'll look at it, I think I'll do it over the weekend because I have more time. We'll look at some of these key speeches and the story arcs told in them. But the first arc of her speech, which was a little uh, discombobulating because I wasn't quite sure how the crescendo was working, but it worked, was about her mom. And she ended all of those things. For, she said, on behalf of, on behalf of, on behalf of. That ended with her acceptance. And that moved me. For her to talk about the people in her life who have adopted her and given her love, her adopted aunts and uncles who were there to support her, uh, and her sister, that was amazing. And the thing is... <laughs> It reminds me of when Hillary came out with her book, It Takes a Village. Now, again, this is like a very Gen X thing. The Gen X, Hillary's a boomer, but it doesn't matter because she's perceptive. It does take a village to survive. If you have a family, and I don't care if you have kids or not. If you're out there, you have neighbors, you have people, you have co-workers, you have the person at the grocery store, you have everybody around you. And it takes a village to grow up in in a normal way. You need all those voices. I, I remember telling Katie, because I was a single mom, from the very beginning, I said, look, here's the deal. You're going to be staying with other people at times. People are going to be caring for you, having over sleepovers and stuff. The deal is, their rules. Their rules. Nobody was allowed to spank her or anything, but she needed to, I wanted her to learn how to adapt to different kinds of situations because being adaptable is one of life's best skills, right? And anybody who has children kind of knows this, but being adaptable is what makes you resilient and makes you be able to take the blows because you're able to see another way to go when the road is blocked. And what I love here is that when it takes a village, you're getting the input from other people, people in your lives, like me and me hanging out with the kids next door. 
they know I'll have a different kind of influence on their kids than they do. And they don't, and they're okay with it because they trust me to be safe with their kids. And that is my responsibility. So uh, we need to look out for one another. And we're going to now join Kamala's village and become a part of history because that's what happened. And that's what's happening. We are joining Kamala's village, Coach's village, the democratic village, the vil- the village of going forward and not going back. All right. So our job post-convention, blah, 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 Jen. That's nice. Okay. I'm just ex- fired up. That's so exciting. And I hope you're fired up too. And if you are, I hope you're smiling right now as you listen to me talk because I'm smiling huge. So our job post-convention is carry message forward. And I was thinking about this last night from a comm standpoint. And one of the things we need to do is to provide confirmation bias. Now, confirmation bias is usually frowned upon all the time. And I'll read you the definition of it in a minute because it's thought of as being bad. But the thing is, I'm going to tell you, it's a powerful way to lock in a belief. Confirmation bias is used all the time to strengthen someone's position, your belief, because it reinforces your belief and it makes it, it locks it in tighter. So what we're trying to do here is lock in the belief that we all believe, lock in the belief that Kamala is the right person for the job, right? That's the belief. And I'm seeing so many Republicans starting to kick the tires, which is great because I really think of them as Americans. And I need those Americans to come in and lock in that belief because it'll give them strength. It'll give them confidence. It'll make them feel good. And one of the ways you lock in your belief is to pay attention to the messages that confirm what you believe. Now, here's the definition of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias describes our underlying tendency, this is a human tendency, to notice, focus on, and give greater credence to evidence that fits with our existing beliefs. Let me say a little bit more. Now, well, actually, let me let me tell you what this means because I'm going to now tell you what the downside is. But evidence that fits... So if you believe... I got to think of something outrageous. Okay. If you believe Sandy Hook didn't happen, you would only pursue information that confirms that belief. You would not want to hear information that disputes it. So you, I think that if you buy a car, like this happened with my daughter, she bought a Subaru. She then proceeded to consume more information post-purchase. She happens to be one of those annoying people that consumes too much information pre-purchase, but she consumed information post-purchase that confirms she made a good decision. We do this all the time. It's very human to do this sort of thing. The problem is, and you can actually see that in a, in a, in a, in a mega scenario where if you have been believing the information you've gotten, especially from very small sources like Fox News or OAN or someplace, if you've been getting news that's not mainstream, and I'm, don't worry, I'm coming for mainstream too in a different podcast, but if you're, if there's no competing ideas, let's, that's probably an easy way to think of it. If there's no other ideas that are coming into your world that compete with your existing beliefs, your confirmation bias is strong. And the reason that's bad is confirmation bias can lead to poor decision-making. It can distort reality from which we draw evidence, meaning you only go to your same sources for evidence. This has been rampant among the QAnon folks. If you watch any interviews, they, they're they almost like a what Excel would call a circular reference, right? They only can point to the evidence that they already are pointing to as evidence that points to their evidence as evidence, right? It's just circular reference. When they conducted experiments and, assi- and assigned dis- decision makers to have a tendency to actively seek and assign value to information that confirms their existing beliefs. It prevented them from having new ideas. And that's, so we're not trying, so let me be clear now. We're, our job is confirmation bias, but it's not to, to um, mind control others. We're not trying to, there's not some psyops going on. We are not here to mind control. We're essentially here to reflect the messaging in a positive way. And I recommend if people want to discuss it with you, just slow down and take the time because they're curious. If they ask, they're curious. You don't have to tell people who don't ask. You have, There's ways to get those conversations started. But for you and you're out there in the world and you want to help people feel good about the way they're thinking, just confirm. Just confirm in a gentle way. And if you can bring facts that are beautiful and clear, bring them. 
So now we're going to take all this energy. So now you understand the mission a little bit. Just go out there and help people understand why you're so passionate, why you care and why they should care. Right. And if they start to move towards you and start to believe in you, just confirm they're making the right decision. Okay. So, uh, now we need to do something, right? It's got to take all this energy and pay it forward. And you know, conventions are designed to inspire and motivate you. But I pu- tried to pull together four simple steps you could follow to get started. Because taking the first step in, in business, in life, anywhere, except for maybe me, because I have too many works in progress on my crochet, I have no problem starting crap. I'm like the perfect crap starter. Um, that's why my, if you know, my license plate is instigator. Yeah, since I was 18. That's the gift from my mom. Okay, the first step being the hardest, find your purpose, the policy or practice that motivates you. And what I mean is that there are so many ways for you to engage. If you are not highly motivated around the policies, and you can go look at the DNC platform. I I went and checked. It's final now. Uh, It's posted and I have a link to it in my companion blog. If you look at the table of contents, you'll see the issues the administration intends to focus on. I'm going to ask you, do any of those match your life experience? These are the policies. Now, the planks of the platform, right? Do any of them make you say, yes, yes, it's about time. If you're like that, if there are issues that get you going, then I really recommend that you support the Harris Wells team via one of the planks of the platform being via a policy. Because you'll get to talk to the people who, like you, share the passion for the issue and maybe take the other side of the issue. They may not agree with you. But the thing is, you're going to be the most well-poised to go have these conversations because you care about it so much. Your issue may not be about uh, legislation or, or planks in the platform. You might care a lot about voter access, which I kind of set aside because that doesn't matter who you are. It matters that you can vote. Uh, It's not related to a campaign issue, but you still can make a huge difference. Campaign offices around the country are looking for non-contentious. I'm here to make, sorry, I'm trying to remember the, um, there's a saying, I can't remember the colloquialism, but I'm here to make this work. It's, there's one about like, uh, anyway, many hands make like work. That's a good one, but I don't like many hands make like work, like white work, mostly because it jackass yelled that at me one time. Uh, But the point is, you get my point. It's back to the village, right? If you care about the issue, they're going to care about the issue and you'll be able to debate it with them and discuss it with them and find, really, I I would urge you not to go head to head with somebody in a debate. We can talk about, I'll I'll do a podcast on how to, how to influence in a discussion because the idea isn't go head to head. (laughs) If you've ever met it, two-year-old, you'll know that's not the way you do anything. You do not go head to head. First of all, you should win because you're the adult. But second of all, you're just an idiot for arguing with a two-year-old. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. So here's my point. <laughs> uh, knowing how to influence in, in the zone is the way to go. And so I, I if you're even supporting the, your election office and you're not contentious, they're going to love you and they're going to put you to work and you're going to help make our elections better. And then finally, you might be a civics person like me who, um, as you know, I like to do one to many because I just, I have a f- efficiency gene that's insane. Um, so if you, you could do things around the electoral process, you could, uh, you can write, you could podcast, wink, wink. You could do TikTok v- videos, whatever it is that works for you, find the thing and whatever the topic is, a plank in the platform, supporting voter rights, talking about our democracy and civics and how to make this a better country. All those are valid So there you go. Okay, that's step one. Find what you care about. Not the administration. That's too broad. I want you to hone in on something where you can go make the... It could be... Sorry, I'll just have one more because this is... A lot of people are really good at this, but I'm not, so I always forget about it. There's a lot of people who are really good at putting on parties and events. And you don't have to... You can do Zoom parties and events. You can do local parties and events. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can do it as a potluck. You could do it and see if you could go get a local um, company to sponsor it. You could get an organization to sponsor it. You don't have to spend a lot of money here, but there's VA halls and granges and 
lodges everywhere across the country where you can bring people together. And I think the beginning of this campaign showed how bringing together our natural tribes and becoming a nation is the way to go. And our natural tribes, as we saw at first, it was evangelicals for Harris, Republicans for Harris, white women over 50 with cats who cannot get along for Harris. There's uh, old crones for Harris and there's witches for Harris and there's um, grumpy old men who will not stop saying get off my lawn for Harris. My point is all those tribes and that's where you have the most value is in your tribal knowledge, your groups. Those tribes have come together to form the Harris Walls Nation, right? As Democrats, as Americans. I don't even like to make this about Democrats anymore. I feel like this is about Americans. But this is the thing here is find your tribe and go vibe with the tribe. You can join a new tribe if you want. That's acceptable too. There really aren't any rules. Okay. So number two is the second step is find your best role. We've talked about this before. I did a whole podcast on it. So I'm not going to go into it deeply here. But finding your best role is you can do it with this little thing I created called the PACE assessment. I know I made up the name, I made up the test. But the thing is, what I did is I tried to go in and take different aspects of our humanness and figure out which tasks in a campaign most most align to different kinds of humans. So if you have or if you have a low mobility, we have tasks for you. If you are an introvert and it's not going to work, we have tasks for you. And I don't mean tasks. I mean missions. Tasks is the wrong word. Sorry, my business language sometimes crawls in. There are missions for you. There, there are areas where you can make a difference. It just depends on who you are and what you're capable of delivering given your circumstances. And that's what I tried to do with the PACE assessment. So there's a link to that in the companion blog. You can get it on my website on the campaign page. Just look down above the box. I put all the blogs in there so you could see what all the names of the blogs are. If you just want to drop in I'm, blogs, each blog, the podcast is in each blog. So you can see the blog and the podcast, but they're all there. So you can see what the topics are. You might just want to dip in and out for different topics. All at jcarroll.com campaign companion. That's where you want to go. Okay. Then once you start building this momentum, so you know what you want to do and you want to start volunteering, make sure that you identify your strengths, that you choose the right activity and that you collaborate with others. That's going to happen. I have, this is all in the blog. I'm not even going to go into this because really what I want you to do next is I want you to go and figure out what you're good at doing, what the tasks are, what the, um, sorry, missions are that you want to accomplish. How do you want to volunteer? And then I want you to go find your people to build your network. And I'm going to call it a political network because it is in the context of politics, but it doesn't mean it's political in that you have to feel weird about it. I don't, some people feel weird about it. Okay. What you're going to do here is if you need baby steps, take baby steps. If you're like me, you go blundering right into the big leagues because that's what you do. I, I, I tend not to ask for permission. That's me. Um, that's why I'm trapped alone in my house because people are like, Jen, calm down. So you want to build your network in the party. It's, it's really going to be an important lifeline for you. And here's some ways you can do it. And, and you can do it, of course, um, in, a, in your home, or you can do it by go- getting out of your house, which is something I need to do more. Start with local meetings. You can attend local party meetings, town halls, community events. You're going to start to see them pop up. There's a list of them online everywhere. Just Google, just use your real words of what you're looking for and see what exists. You can leverage social media. Maybe that's where you first start to to. to Try your hand at saying things out loud if you're not used to it or disagreeing or asking more. I tend not to disagree as much as I, my style is usually to ask a hard question to get them to say more because it's really easy to say something, um, a non sequitur and not have to defend it. But when you ask people to tell me more about that, tell me more why you believe that's true. That's such a powerful question. We'll go into some of these in a pod, upcoming podcast. But tell me more why that's so important to you or tell me more why you think that's true. That's a really good way to use social media. You won't get a lot of answers, but you'll do better on Facebook with that kind of question. You can also, if you are brave, do some of that on LinkedIn. But I would keep it around values and I would not ever blame anyone because LinkedIn can 
LinkedIn can do a little uh, whipsaw and hurt you. So even I, people know my, what I believe in and they know who I am, but I don't go hard about it on LinkedIn just because it's a weird work environment and I don't want you ever not to be employed because some jackass misunderstood what you said. Okay. And then there's the bigger things. You can go for political rallies and fundraisers. Fundraisers are pretty fun and, and you're considered a good guest if you bring others to the fundraiser. That's always a good thing. Doesn't mean you have to pry open just your pocket. You want to get your friends to pry open their pockets too. And this is so important. Donating does not, is not about how much grassroots campaigns, and we're going to talk about grassroots in a minute, but grassroots campaigns like ours really value five bucks from everybody. And I talked about this before. It's because skin in the game matters. Once this is my rule. If you go to therapy, you pay for the therapy. If anybody else is paying for your therapy, you're not doing it right. It has to hurt financially for you to take it seriously. It, you have to feel it. So that's why I encourage everybody to donate, but it can be in a, in a, at a rate, an amount that's okay for you. It shouldn't cause you pain. It just should be your way of saying, hey, yeah, I'm going to, it's like when you uh, walking down the mall and uh, I, I did this in Burlington, Vermont. I love this. And there's like buskers out there playing music and poetry and cool stuff because it's Vermont. And, um, and I throw change in the bucket. That's it. That's my way of showing support. So this is, you, you can fundraise, you can participate in fundraisers. You can't go to the $20,000 seat once unless you have the $20,000. But the rest of us can go to the hot dog fundraisers and the taco night fundraisers and all the other good ones. So do it. It's fun. It's really fun, actually. I, that's how I grew up, guys. It's really fun. And that and I'm a kid. I remember a great fundraiser you had at Steckle Park in Santa Paula. And we ran around like lunatics, the kids. And the adults were uh, probably a little bit lit. But they were having a great time. And it was a Democratic Central Committee meeting out in a park or a barbecue. And it was a fundraiser for local politicians. And there is so much you can do locally for your local candidates. And I'll do a podcast on down ballot because that is essential right now. But I just want to hook you up. So go participate in volunteering events. Things like canvassing, phone banking, all those kind of things. They're really great ways. So that's the fourth way to go find your people. Uh, just go volunteer one day somewhere. Volunteer and just see who's out there. Maybe you don't like them. Maybe they're not your kind of people. You'll find them. I'm convinced you'll find them. And then this is a big one, and this is a, a tribute to my friend Sandra, my lifelong roommate, or not lifelong roommate, my roommate in college, who is my lifelong friend and sister, um, break the ice easily and start the conversation. So yeah, a lot of people are really uncomfortable in new settings. That's not been a problem for me. Again, I'm kept at home now because <laughs> This is not a problem for me, but I thought I'd give you a couple icebreakers. Literally, they're in the blog, so you can come back and get them. But these are some good ones. Just open any questions to kind of lead to deeper discussions and maybe find out how you're aligning. Remember, if you picked a policy issue uh, as the thing you're going to pursue, there's a good chance you're going to really find your people fast. But if you stayed more generic, you got to find your people with it, like elect like helping out the bowling voting booths, you're going to have to find your people that there that are like you. So here's some questions for you. You could say, what brought you to this event? So you just, you know, you don't have to be like, you don't have to sound like me. That was pretty lame. I would never sound like that in real life. I would be smiling, putting out my hand and saying, hi, I'm Jennifer Carroll. What brought you here today? That's how I would go. How did you get involved? Here's another question. How did you get involved with gun con contro control? Oh, we don't say gun control. We say, I've got to go look this up. We say smart gun laws. How did you, there we go. It's all about messaging people. How is it, how did you get involved with smart gun laws? I am involved because, and that gives, so you can share your story first or they can share their story. It's really nice to let them just go first. It's because then you can go, same, same, that happened to me. And that kind of mutuality instantly starts to bring you two together. You can do something that's a little more generic, especially if you're more in a generic setting that's not about a specific policy. What issues are most important to you in this election? Same damn question I asked you at the top of this podcast. Why are you here and what do you care about? It opens up the conversation and it'll help you identify common ground. 
And then finally, have you ever volunteered before? That's a great one because it just makes you, it allows you instantly to connect with someone who is also feeling awkward or uh, very self-conscious. <laughs> Any of those things that happen in social settings where you just feel like, oh my God, I don't belong here. How did I get here? Why did I listen to everybody? What have I done? So there you go. Those kind of questions. You can think of more. If you're going with somebody, rehearse a few questions, have a few planned. Also do the trick. If you're going in person to any of these things, there's a trick. And it's so funny because um, one of the speakers talked about it. Was it Clinton? I think it was Bill Clinton. I do this thing before I public, publicly speak, even before the podcast, where we expand our chest. You do this deep breath. And sometimes I pound on my chest because it'll remove grungus that I didn't expect that. I learned from a theater friend. You just take in air, take in like three more breaths of air. So you're really, really, really full of air. Pound your chest a few times. Cough like a gross person because you have grungus and you're a Gen Xer. That's why. If you're Gen Z, cough because you vape. And then when you speak, you have plenty of air in your lungs to support yourself. So you don't sound like a withering flower in the corner. Um, you sound like a person who's happy to be there. So there's a trick. Bill Clinton's trick, Jen Carroll's trick, theater trick, everybody's trick, but normal people don't know about it because you didn't hang out with weird people like I did. Oh, the places you will go when you start to do something. Michelle Obama was right. This is all about doing something. That's what we're going to focus on. And you're going to find that this doing something pays you back. You're going to build a network. You're going to meet new people. You're going to work together for something that's amazing. And I'll tell you what, the part that's hard to remember, and it's, it's so sweet. It's just so sweet. Well, millions of us are in our homes and this uh, whole campaign feels somewhat like what's happening out there, but not in our homes. It does come back home. And when it comes back home is in two places. One is when we have a, when we win the election, that, that joy, I can only tell you from Obama, from Clinton, that joy is unbelievable. And it does feel like yours. It feels like you can step into it, own it, wear it like a jacket, cuddle in it, like a blanket, wrap yourself up in it to, in the, in the days and months going forward, because our country is safe, our country is happy, and our country has a plan. That's one way you'll feel it connected to it again. And then, the, of course, the the day I lost it with Barack Obama, I mean, I just, poor Katie, <laughs> I just lost it and I made her watch every minute, including my sn sniffing and crying and jumping up and down and sitting back down was when is the swearing in. On January 20th, when we, or 21st, I'm not sure which day it'll be, but when we swear in Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, this will, you will feel it. You will feel it in every fiber of your being. If you've committed to this campaign, if you've joined in, and if you've been part of this, and if any way you get to tell the people, your people, I helped make that happen, you will feel it. And it's so good. So don't think this doesn't have a payoff. There's multiple pays off. Multiple way, mul that's not a sentence. There's multiple ways this pays off. And it's, and it's also pays off in our democracy. And there was a great, I cannot wait to talk about the speeches. There was a great line about at the end of Kamala's speech. It was her last line, I believe, when she talked about us writing the story of democracy. And I'm bawling in my chair because that's why I'm doing this podcast, right? I want to be one of the people who's right, who's helping write the story of democracy. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, I didn't expect to go out on an emotional note, but um, I'm super grateful to have this podcast. I'm grateful to have you listening and being with me. And let's dig into those speeches tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Make sure you subscribe and rate, and I'll be back with another episode really soon.